Good afternoon. My name is Tara Fortune, and on behalf of Carla's staff in the University of Minnesota and the Immersion 2012 Conference Planning Committee, I am delighted to welcome you to the fourth International Conference on Language Immersion Education which are with our theme, Bridging Contexts for a Multilingual World. Allow me to introduce our speaker for this evening. Output hypothesis, Canadian-French immersion, LREs, or language-related episodes, languaging. These are a few words that spring to mind when I think about the impressive body of work that Meryl Swain and her more than four decades of teaching, researching, and publishing has offered the field of second language acquisition and immersion education specifically. Dr. Meryl Swain is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Curriculum, Teaching and Learning at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto in Canada. She continues to serve the field of second language teaching and learning as teacher, lecturer, researcher, writer, colleague, and mentor. She is regularly invited to give talks and workshops in many parts of the world, and we are truly delighted to have her here with us tonight. As you can read in her bio statement in the conference program, Merrill is the recipient of several prestigious awards acknowledging her outstanding professional contributions in research and education. Her most recent award came in 2011. She received an honorary doctorate from the University of Vasa in Finland. I would like to briefly speak to two of Merrill's many qualities that I especially admire. First, Merrill has a genius for clarity. Her latest Multilingual Matters publication with Penny Kinnear and Linda Steinman titled Sociocultural Theory in Second Language Education provides a wonderful example of this quality. Using narrative as a point of departure, she and her co-authors unpack challenging Vygotskyan concepts such as mediation, activity theory, and the zone of proximal development. The concrete lived experiences of each narrative and the clearness of the writing give meaning to the book's more abstract theoretical ideas. Secondly, for me, Merrill embodies what it means to be a lifelong learner. As the field of second language education has evolved, so too has Merrill's thinking and examination of language acquisition and learning. For more than a decade now, Merrill has been making use of sociocultural theory of mind as a lens for research and understanding learning in second language contexts. New and deeper understandings of Vygotsky's ideas and the critical role that languaging plays in the cognitive and affective development of human persons have now taken her research beyond the field of second language acquisition and into gerontology. Merrill and colleagues have begun to explore the relationship between social interaction and cognitive affective functioning among elderly residents in a long-term care facility. They're asking, if languaging by older adults who have been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment helps to restore aspects of their cognitive affective functioning. This line of questioning sets the stage for new insights about what constitutes quality care for our elderly. Please help me to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Meryl Swain. First of all, I'd like to thank Tara very much for that introduction. It was really lovely. And thank you for mentioning my work with the elderly because it's very important. 
Um, and Meredith, thank you for that introduction to the whole conference because I never knew those things about Mark Twain and I didn't know those things about the Mississippi. So I learned in those four minutes. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Um, and I'd also like to thank the planning committee for having invited me to this conference and, and asked me to do this plenary. And I must say, it's just wonderful to see so many people here uh, who are all helping to build bridges to multilingual worlds. So when I was first approached to uh, give this plenary, it was almost two years ago. My reaction at that time was that I didn't have any new immersion uh, research data to talk about, but that I did have some new ideas. The new ideas were inspired by Vygotsky and sociocultural theory. So back then I gave Tara the title um, of a Vygotsky and sociocultural perspective on immersion education, the title that you um, see in your program. Well, that turns out to be sort of a crazy idea, because it would take a book to do justice to that title, to the original title. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the work of Vygotsky, let me just say a few words. Um, oops, I think I might do it this way. Let me just say a few words about Vygotsky. So this is Vygotsky. Um, I guess. The, one could start by saying how handsome he is. Um, I've had students taking courses with me that say, oh, I'll take the course now that I've seen him. <laughs> okay, so I just want to say a few uh, words about him. Um, he was certainly a prolific writer. Over the last several decades, his volumes and volumes of writing have been translated from Russian into English and have had considerable impact in various educational and psychological settings in North America. His impact here has been due in part to its divergence from Piagetian theory, which dominated developmental psychology at the time. Contrary to the work of Piaget, Vygotsky argued that our higher mental processes, our, our thinking, our higher mental processes, have their origin in social interaction rather than being developmentally determined. Vygotsky died of tuberculosis um, in 1934, and he died at the very young age of 37. But still, he had careers as a literary and theater critic, uh, as a teacher, as a developmental psychologist, as a researcher, and as a theorist. Vygotsky also set a model for us all. He spoke Russian, English, German, Hebrew and French, and he also studied Latin, Greek, and Esperanto. So clearly, with that volume of work, I had to narrow down uh, what it was that I was going to talk about from that huge big title, um, and from everything that Vygotsky had to say, uh, I had to narrow down to something doable tonight. I finally decided, um, to narrow this talk to a discussion of what is being called the L1, L2 debate in immersion education. That is, the debate about when the student's first language should be used um, and when the target language should be used during target language instructional time. And I do want to say that, of course, I'm aware that there may be more, when I say the first language, that it's really possible that there could be more than one first language and also that in referring to second languages, that what we call a second language could in fact be a third or a fourth language. I'm very aware of that, but I think that um, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to use L1 and L2, um, and I do think that um, even though those things are, that, that, that we could be saying L1s and L2s, um, I think that my argument, what I want to say tonight, doesn't change. Uh, it just makes it more complex, that's all. So the L1, L2 debate. Um, my reason um, for focusing on this particular issue of when um, and which language should be used when, uh, my reasons are twofold. 
First of all, I believe that Vygotsky's ideas can provide us with several theory-based guiding principles related to language use in immersion classrooms. Secondly, um, from what I've heard from immersion teachers uh, recently, um, what I've read in the research immersion literature and also observed myself in immersion classes, suggests that language use patterns in many current immersion programs are quite different from those found in Canadian immersion classes in the first few decades of their existence. In those early years of immersion education, there was a rather strict rule that only the target language was to be used during instructional time. And this has been referred to as the monolingual policy of immersion education. This L2 only policy appears to have been diluted over the years, and very often for pragmatic reasons. So consider, for example, this quote from an early French immersion teacher. So this is an early French immersion teacher with 13 years of um, experience. She says, it's hard to keep French going all the time, especially at grade three with EQAO, which I'll explain in a second, with EQAO testing. French is taking a beating by grade four. We need to cover content, and this goes faster if I do it in English. EQAO is the Educational Quality Assessment of Ontario. And it's a set of tests, of standardized tests, that are given um, at grade three, grade six, and grade nine. And they are in English. So this teacher is basically saying, in order for me to prepare these kids, I, I need to cover so much content. And in my French immersion class, it goes faster if I do it in English. So then you could contrast that um, view, uh, Mary's view, with this next quote by Becky. Uh, Becky has had 15 years of experience, both as a primary level teacher in an early French immersion program and as a um, teacher educator. So Becky says, French instructional time in immersion classrooms should be largely, almost entirely in French. It's feasible for teachers to use French from the very beginning. That's what makes it immersion. The reason to use English should never be because it's too hard in the target language. The reason should never be because the students don't understand a topic. Any topic can be taught in the target language. So there you have two really very um, divergent views. Becky, by the way, adheres as strictly as possible to the principle that only the target language should be used in immersion classes uh, by the teacher. She makes it a practice to address visitors that come to her classroom only in French, and even in casual encounters in the schoolyard or in the street, she addresses students, parents, and community members in French. So these contrasting views, Mary and, and Becky, about L1 and L2 language use, hold, um, whether the con uh, hold true. Um, whether the context is one-way or two-way immersion programs, um, whether they be early immersion or middle immersion or late immersion, um, we see the same um, range of, of, of views in terms of um, how much and when uh, and why um, the L1 and L2 are used. So it seemed to me like a useful task to see if Vygotsky's thinking might provide any insights into the complex question of which language should be used by whom and under what conditions. And I thought that perhaps we could draw some guiding principles from his work. And in doing so, I have in mind the context of one-way and two-way immersion programs. I think that um, for indigenous programs and for uh, heritage language programs, that they're different enough that perhaps these guiding principles, which I hope to give you by the end of this talk, um, might uh, need to be adjusted. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really addressing the, um, the issues for one-way and two-way immersion programs. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to present uh, several of Vygotsky's key concepts. 
Um, the first one that I'm going to focus on in this talk um, is about mediation and the related concept of languaging, and we're going to spend most of the time on that. Um, and then talk also, and, and that will lead to the first guiding principle. The second thing, uh, the second concept of Vygotsky's is the way in which he thinks about cognition and emotion, um, and that will lead to the second guiding principle. And then um, the zone of proximal development, um, or as you here call it for short, the ZPD, and we in Canada call it the ZPD. <laughs> So if you hear me say ZPD, you know what it is. Um, so then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss each concept, and then I'll briefly summarize a few studies from immersion contexts that highlight or can be, can be interpreted or reinterpreted in light of Vygotsky's insights. And then, as I say, end with a guiding principle for the use of the L1 and target language during target language instructional time that I think follows uh, from the theory and research. So by the end of this talk, um, I hope to have provided three guiding principles for the use of the L1 and target language uh, during target language instructional time. Okay, so I'm going to begin with the idea of mediation and the related idea of languaging. Um, and in fact, as I've already said, I think I'm going to spend most of the time talking about um, mediation and languaging. Um, but that's because I think that this idea is a, is a difficult one, and it's um, really important and key in understanding um, the first guiding principle. The others, I think, are more instinctively um, easy to grasp. Okay, Vygotsky um, understood language to be a psychological tool. That is, a tool that mediates our thinking. So, um, in an analogy with material tools like shovels and pens and, and toothbrushes, um, which help us carry out or mediate physical tasks such as digging a hole, writing, and brushing our teeth. So, in an analogy to that, Vygotsky argued that we make use of symbolic tools to help us carry out mental tasks such as planning, organizing, focusing our attention, and so on. Vygotsky argued that language is the most crucial of all symbolic tools. Language um, for Vygotsky is the source of, it's a source, okay? So language is the source, that's absolutely essential, is the source of our higher mental processes, and language comes to mediate them. So Vygotsky demonstrated through his research uh, with children how language is the source of our higher mental functioning and how language comes to function as a psychological tool that mediates our thinking. I'm going to illustrate this with an example of the sort of research that he did um, that led him to, to make these claims. So Vygotsky studied um, infants and young children. And he noted that initially a child's behavior is mediated by concrete objects in its surrounding. So for example, um, a father says to his child, go find your teddy bear, Kathy. So while Kathy is searching for her teddy bear, Kathy sees a bright red balloon and begins to play with it. Kathy's actions here are controlled by objects in her environment, in, in this case by the bright red balloon. But once Kathy starts to learn a language, let's say it's English, <laughs> Her behavior comes to be mediated by the English of those around her. So now, when her father tells her to go and get her teddy bear, Kathy does so. Finally, while still a young child, as Kathy continues to hear and observe those around her interacting in English, and as she begins to use English in interaction with others, these interactions, mediated by English, will help Kathy to um, focus her attention um, as well as help her to organize what she is doing and to plan future behavior. So now English becomes a tool for Kathy, a, 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 a cognitive tool for her. She herself can use English 
to accomplish these mental functions. Now Kathy is able to say to herself, I want my teddy bear. I'll go to my bedroom because that's where I last saw it. And she does so undistracted by all her other toys. So what has happened is that the functions that Kathy has heard, observed, and taken part of in English um, are internalized. That is, they've moved from the social plane, from the, from the outside world, from the world of objects and the world of people outside to the psychological plane, in other words, to the inside. With this shift of language functions from the social to the individual plane, a qualitative leap takes place. Instead of language being used simply to communicate something to another person, now language also mediates one's own higher mental functions. When language is used for these purposes, that's what I refer to as languaging. So before I continue, I want to read to you an everyday example of languaging. And this is, I, I find that this example will, at least I hope it really gives you an idea of what I mean by, by languaging and what it can do for you. Um, it, it comes from a Dear Ann Landers column. Now, I'm not sure if Ann Landers is still, still around, but uh, there, you know what I, I mean, you know the columns where you write in for advice. So what I want you to do um, as, as we go through this letter that's being written to Dear Ann Landers is listen to how language serves to focus the woman's attention on the problem at hand, which is whether she should marry her boyfriend, Jerry, and observe how, by languaging, she organizes her thoughts and, well, you'll see what happens. So, here we go. <clears throat> Dear Ann, I'm a 26-year-old woman and feel like a fool asking you this question. Nope, she, she doesn't know what, she doesn't know the answer yet. I'm a 26-year-old woman and feel like a fool asking you this question, but should I marry this guy or not? Jerry is 30, but sometimes he acts like 14. Jerry is a salesman and makes good money, but has lost his wallet three times since I've known him, and I've had to help him meet the payments on his car. The thing that bothers me most, I think, is that I have the feeling he doesn't trust me. After every date, he telephones. He says, it's just to say an extra good night, but I'm sure he's checking to see if I had a late date with someone else. One night I was in the shower and didn't hear the phone. He came over and sat on the porch all night. I found him asleep on the swing when I went to get the paper the next morning at 6.30 a.m. I had a hard time convincing him that I'd been in the house the whole time. Now, on the plus side, Jerry's very good looking <laughs> and appeals to me physically. Well, that does it. I've been sitting here with this pen in my hand for 15 minutes trying to think of something else good to say about him, and nothing comes to mind. <laughs> Don't bother to answer this. You've helped me. You've helped, you've helped more than you will ever know. This is a fabulous example of languaging. Okay? That's what languaging is the young woman's use of language to mediate her thinking, to help her solve her problem. Through languaging, she came up with a solution she didn't know she had. She created new meaning through languaging. She came to know something she didn't know by languaging. In other words, her language served as a cognitive tool. Now, let me give you another example. And this time it's from two grade seven early immersion um, students who are not writing to Anne. Um, two French immersion students, Nina and Dara. Um, let me make it quite clear why it is that I'm giving you these examples. It's because it's important um, to understand that language is not just a way of saying what's already in your head. So it's not that you have, you know, you have this idea in your head that's already formed um, and you communicate to somebody else. I mean, that happens, that's true, but that's not what languaging is. What languaging is, um, it's a tool that helps us think. We're not just talking, 
Our language is mediating between our unknown thoughts and their reality, bringing them into focus and turning them into something that can be reorganized and rethought. Okay, so now the Nina and Dara example. Um, Nina and Dara were working on a collaborative task. They, they, these are grade seven immersion kids, and they were asked to um, write a story. They were given a set of pictures, um, and they were asked to write a story uh, based on these pictures. And one of the pictures showed, in, there were a set of pictures, and the, the girl had been woken up by an alarm clock at six o'clock in the morning, and then she had immediately fallen back to sleep. Um, and they um, wrote a sentence about that part, and, and they wrote, um, so Nina and Dara wrote, uh, it, it's now 6.01, and she falls asleep without a sound. So in French, il est maintenant 6 h et 1, et elle s'endort sans bruit. So the key point here is that, um, that you'll see is about the sans bruit, meaning without a sound. Okay, so um, and this was actually in a study that we did. So, so the stu the, they wrote that, they wrote their story, and then a teacher reformulated uh, what it is that they had written. And in this particular sentence, the teacher reformulated this sombre to dans le silence. And then later, much later, we asked the students, Nina and Dara, if um, we showed them what it was that the teacher had done and what they thought about it. So it was what we call a stimulated recall. And Nina says, well, I think Sambri, it's more she fell asleep and she didn't make any noise. But silence is like everything around her is silent. And Dara, her partner, says, so she changed our meaning. Okay. Um, so, um, when the two students saw how the teacher had reformulated their story, Nina, uh, that was how she um, tried to explain why she didn't like the teacher's correction. And in order to do that, she explained to Dara and the researchers the differences in meaning between the two versions. And of course, um, she had to use language to mediate this explanation. And in this case, Nina used her first language, English, as a tool to mediate her understanding of the difference between the two meanings, which is what you see her doing here. By using English, Nina and Dara were able to focus their attention and organize their thoughts and internalize or learn aspects of their meaning of some aspects of the meaning of Sambri and Don Le Silence. The evidence for the fact that they internalize this knowledge is that much, much later, we asked the students on their own to write the story in French. And they continued um, with, they were, they, they, inter, they, I haven't got a slide for this, I forgot. Um, they, they, when they present, when they wrote in, on their own in French, they wrote and maintained what it was that they thought um, uh, represented their story, but took on uh, some of what it was that the teacher had um, the teacher had done in the reformulation. So um, the point here uh, is when, what Vygotsky sa said, and he said, when learning a second language, one does not return to the immediate world of objects and does not repeat past linguistic developments, but instead uses the native language as a mediator between the world of objects and the new language. So this theoretical insight is absolutely key to understanding um, the first guiding principle, uh, which I'll present shortly. So as we all know, um, two of the goals of immersion education are to learn a target language and to learn content through the target language. And languaging is relevant to both. The Nina and Dara example illustrates how languaging in the L1 mediated their understanding um, and learning of context-specific meanings of the target language. At a micro level, what occurred was the internalization of the different nuanced meanings of dans le silence and sans bruit. And the Ann Landers example 
illustrates at the level of everyday knowledge how languaging focuses our attention and mediates so problem solving and knowledge building. It's the equivalent of content learning. So now we need to ask what happens when immersion students are asked to do difficult, complex thinking in a second language as in immersion classrooms. And to address this question, I'll turn now to research from immersion contexts. There are a number of studies, uh, lots of studies actually out there, which look at students' use of their first and target languages during target language instruction time. Some of these studies, uh, like the first four listed here by Tara Fortune, Kim Potowski, Maggie Broner and, and Dee Tedek, and Susan Ballinger and Roy Lister, those studies are naturalistic and ethnographic um, observational studies conducted in immersion classrooms. And then studies um, like our own, which where we pulled students out of the class and observed their language use patterns while carrying out a language-related task. And Nina and Dara fit into um, that latter category. So what these studies have done is to look at um, the frequency of use of the L1 and L2 in, in um, immersion classrooms, the functions of L1 and L2, um, and also the context of um, L1 and L2 use. And as you might well expect, the uh, findings are pretty complex, uh, but I'll try to summarize them. So with respect to uh, frequency of, of, lang of the first language, so I'm just focused on the first language, with respect to the frequency of first language use, and this is during target language instructional time, you see a across the studies, you see a wide variation. In some classes, uh, the use of the L1 is very limited. In other classes, the use of the L1 is, is, high, is very frequent. Um, with respect to functions of uh, the L1, like what are the functions for which um, the first language is used? Things um, that have been noted over and over again is focusing attention, figuring out what it is that the teacher expects of them, um, developing an understanding of a topic or task, searching for target language vocabulary, explaining, informing, and seeking information about a topic or activity. And with respect to context of use, um, again, I'm summarizing over a number of studies. Uh, there was more L use uh, when students were speaking with peers than when with teachers. The content was, uh, when the content was non-language focused, uh, that is in, in con um, subject areas like science, than when the content was language related such as writing. The content material was, um, when the content material was abstract and complex, they were more likely to use English than when it was concrete and less complex. Uh, when the purple purpose was social um, versus academic, and the use of the L1 was very high um, when used to express feelings. And importantly, as L2 as the second language proficiency increases um, across grade levels and um, within, within grade levels, L1 languaging decreases and L2 languaging increases. So this research suggests, as Vygotsky would predict, that the students made use of their L1 as a tool to mediate their understanding of task and their understanding and production of content and, um, sorry, and, and I would add um, their understanding and production of content and of emotion. So these uh, studies are descriptive in nature. Uh, they tell us what is happening in immersion programs, when the L1 and L2 are most likely to be used, and for what purposes. For example, in Tara Fortune's research, she found that her grade five focal um, immersion students use the target language most often, and this is a quote, during language product-oriented activities, such as math, problem solving, and presentations that required either written or oral language to be produced and presented. In the target language, of course. Um, it's helpful to know of course it's helpful to know when and why the L1 and L2 are used because it suggests how the instructional activities um, can be designed, how we can go ahead and design further instructional activities that will foster and support uh, the use of the L2. However, what we do not know 
from these studies is of any use of the L1 by the students is essential if it actually expedites the learning process or is simply the easier route to take. What we need is research which traces how the L1 and the L2 are used during instructional time to the final product um, so, we, so that we can trace from when it is that it actually happens when the L1 and the L2 are used and, and trace that right through and see what happens um, in the final uh, product, um, what, what the students learn as a result of it. So we need evidence that demonstrates that the use of the L1 serves to mediate content in second language learning. Um, I only know of one small scale study that is suggestive, and if you have others, I would love to hear about them. Um, and it's because it's very difficult research to do, actually. So in this case, the study was carried out as a classroom assignment many years ago um, by Laurie Bean, Miles Turnbull, and Jane Speck. Lori uh, was a teacher, this was in a grade seven uh, late immersion class, and Lori was a teacher and she was very concerned that the level of her students' French was not sufficiently advanced for the rather difficult and complex content she was expected to teach using French. So until she and her colleagues under undertook this uh, action research, Lori had meticulously followed the classroom monolingual rule that we only speak French in this class. Laurie's students had been, um, the, the tasks that they were asked to do, they, so they had been um, gathering information each individually about native peoples of Canada, about um, where, uh, the, their environment, what they ate, um, where they lived, and what was the connection be, between all of those things. And so the task now, they gathered this information and what they were supposed to do in small groups um, was to engage in collaborative dialogue, and collaborative dialogue is a um, type of languaging, to engage in collaborative dialogue to combine the information that each had in order to understand the relationships between the climate and the food and so on and so forth. And then they knew that the next day they would make an oral presentation in French. That's absolutely a crucial part of the, the, the pedagogy that they would do the presentation in French based on any notes or whatever it is that they had um, done. And it was made clear to the students that, as always, they should use French in their groups. But in spite of this, of course, um, all groups made considerable use of their L1 English. And I say, of course, because, because of course. <laughs> um, I was going to say more, but I will, <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> but, so both the collaborative dialogue of the students as they worked on this task and their oral presentations the next day were tape recorded. Um, so what they, what they did, um, Lori and her, and her colleagues examined the uses of English in the students' collaborative dialogue, so specifically where they used English. And they found that English was most often used in relation to vocabulary searches and also to structure the activity and to respond to or deal with the cognitive challenges it presented. The researchers then, the next step that they took was to identify examples in the oral presentation, which the students gave um, the next day, where it could be argued that the students languaging in English during the preparation for the oral presentation in French had been transferred to the um, oral presentations. So they found a number of instances in which the results of the vocabulary searches that they had done during the preparation time were carried out and carried forward into the presentation, um, providing evidence of learning. They also found examples where English had been used to deal with the cognitive challenges presented by the task um, that were transferred to the oral presentation. And I'm going to give you um, an example um, which actually doesn't come from the publication, but comes from the term paper, which I happened to find quite accidentally. I'm, I'm looking at Miles Turnbull, who's here. I mean, you probably don't even have a copy, Miles, and can't verify that I've got the right transcript, right? Anyhow, these, so these, um, in this particular group, um, Z and J, 
and there was another student but involved in this little bit of collaborative dialogue. Um, uh, only Z and J are talking. And Z says, you've got lots of coniferous trees. Remember that what they're doing is they're trying to figure out what things are for and how they all interconnect. You've got lots of coniferous trees. It's good for, and Jay says, I don't know what it's good for. And Z says, to build houses, such as longhouse and stuff like that. Jay, so what about to build totem poles? Yeah, to build totem poles. And then in their notes, they wrote, and I'm not going to try, uh, you can see the French, the French has lots of errors in it, um, but um, they write down, so that's what their conversation was, their collaborative dialogue, and they, it's collaborative in that they're each contributing and building knowledge together so that they're coming up with something more in the end than they did, they had individually at the beginning. The in, they write down, the indigenous people live in big houses made of cedar and cut trees to build totem poles. Okay, so you see what was done in English and you see what was done in French. And then they gave a presentation um, the next day. So in this example, it's clear from the notes that the students did have the L2 proficiency to uh, express um, the main ideas in French, but, and here's the key, that English mediated the development and the coherence of those ideas. In effect, their use of English helped them to focus on the task at hand and organize their thoughts. It scaffolded their presentation in French. So the next, uh, with the, the oral presentations, those were given to independent raters um, that listened to the recordings of each of the presentations. And Z and J's group were given the highest ranking of all groups in terms of quality of French and cognitive sophistication. Bean, Turnbull, and Speck concluded that L1 use can both support and enhance L2 development and function as an effective tool for dealing with cognitively demanding content. The Bean et al. study does not tell us that the use of the L1 expedites the L2 learning process, but it does suggest that when the going gets tough in the L2, the L1 is an important cognitive tool which helps learners organize their thoughts focus their attention and scaffold their understanding and production of the L2. For this reason, students, and I'm emphasizing students, should be permitted to use their L1 for the purpose of working through complex ideas. In fact, it might be argued that it's futile to ask students not to use their L1 when working through cognitively and emotionally complex ideas as they'll do it covertly in any case if they're not allowed to do it overtly. Permitting the students to, uh, there's a, and there's another reason actually for having them do it overtly is because you as a teacher can listen to what they're saying and what they're saying actually represents what the processes are that they're going through to get there. So you the teacher will learn something about what it is and how it is that the students are, are getting where they are. And, it, it's a great opportunity for teachers to um, build immediate target language curricular activities that integrate language um, and uh, um, language and, uh, and content teaching. Anyhow, permitting the students to use their L1 to language at times when the complexity of the task makes it t uh, necessary to do so still allows for the target language to play a key role in the activity. It's of utmost importance that the students are required to produce an end, oral, or written product in the target language. Doing so means that the end goal of a target language product will prioritize language learning processes such as cross-linguistic comparison in form and meaning and target language vocabulary searches. Okay, I'm now um, going to show you the first guiding principle. I hope that most of you have a handout because it's on your handout and you'll probably find it easier to read on that. Okay, so here's the first guiding principle. It follows from everything that I just said. Students should be permitted to use their L1 during collaborative dialogue or pri private speech in order to mediate their understanding and generation of complex ideas. All of that is what languaging is. They should be permitted then to do that as they prepare to produce an end product, oral or written, in the target language. 
However, as student proficiency in the L2 increases, students should increasingly be encouraged to language using the L2 as a mediating tool. Further, when new and complex material is introduced within and across grade levels, students should again be allowed to make use initially of their L1 to language, that is, to mediate their thinking. Okay, so that's um, uh, the first guiding principle. The second um, we're gonna move on to, uh, which is related to the cognitive emotion relationship. Um, so I wanna continue the exploration of how Vygotsky's theoretical perspective is helpful in developing guidelines for the use of L1 and L2 in immersion classrooms. As we've seen, the most important reason is Vygotsky's understanding of language, of his understanding of language as a mediating tool, as a cognitive tool, not just a tool for communicating, um, as a psychological tool. But um, not only did Vygotsky say that about language, he saw cognition and affect not as two separate distinct processes, but rather as totally interwoven and as, as inseparable. Um, I have a quote here from DiPardo and Pot Potter, which I th is um, very apropos of Vygotsky. Emotions develop in concert with the whole of a person's cognitive and social life, continually constructed through social interaction and progressively internalized. But you know, if you look at the research, the S research in the field of second language acquisition over the last few decades, it's prioritized cognition. In fact, even a lot of the work that's been done with the ZPD, um, which I will talk about in a few minutes, um, even most of that has been focused on um, cognition rather than bringing together cognition and emotion. There's been some research in the field, um, of second language acquisition at least, on effective con constructs such as language anxiety and willingness to communicate, but even though I think that we all know, we know intuitively how important the link is between cognition and affect. There's really surprisingly little research in the field that treats both cognition and emotions within the same study, and even fewer which make the link between these constructs explicit. So if you remember Nina and Dara, they were the immersion students who remained committed to the meaning they had co-constructed in their story about a girl who was sleeping silently. We asked them um, later, uh, again, we met with them quite a few times. We asked them to reflect um, on the teacher's corrections. And um, Nina said, some of the corrections, they seemed like they changed the story sort of, and so it wasn't really ours. Here, I think we observe both cognition and affect at work. Nina, Nina's efforts to explain the differences in meaning were not just mediated by her use of English, but were motivated by her desire to maintain the story that she and Dara had established. That's to say, in Nina's use of English to mediate her explanation, so in what we, we've seen and, and, and in her um, explanation here, it would be very difficult to separate out the roles of affect and cognition. They're so tightly intertwined. And it's Vygotsky's, Vygotsky's lens that helps us to see this fusion of cognition and um, of cognitive and emotional goals. So I'd like to turn um, to uh, w one study um, briefly. It's carried out by Susan Ballinger and Roy Lister. And I'll, I'm going to interpret um, the researchers' findings in light of this Vygotsky and insight of this bringing together of cognition and emotion. And my focus is on the perspective of several immersion teachers that they talked about, um, and, and the immersion teachers um, thinking about the relationship between emotion and cognition. So one of the main research questions that Bellinger and Lister asked was how is it that two-way Spanish-English immersion teachers encourage their students to communicate in Spanish during Spanish instructional time. 
The research was observed in the classrooms over a four-week period, and they also uh, interviewed the teachers. So in this two-way immersion program, um, the instructional time was divided uh, half um, be evenly between English and Spanish. Um, but they did so at the grade one level, uh, the teachers decided to reorganize the way the program was delivered from a one teacher, one language model to a system where one teacher stayed with the class all year long while changing the language of, of instruction on a weekly basis. The motivation for this decision was to, and this is a quote, the motivation of the decision was to address the emotional and academic needs of the students by remaining with only one class of students for the entire year. So I think this objective reflects the importance of considering both affect and intellect in program planning while still being able to establish clear practices with respect to when the use of the non-English language was expected. So that was at the grade one level. At the grade three level, um, half the instructional time was spent with an English teacher and half with a Spanish teacher, and the al alternating weeks were spent in each language. The grade three teachers uh, were consistent in their use of Spanish during the Spanish instructional periods and English during the English parts of the program. The researchers quote um, Ms. Ramirez, uh, who was one of the grade three teachers, as follows. It's very important they speak Spanish to one another, but it's a process. It's a difficult process. Because from the point of view that the children are so saturated by English, that makes it difficult for them to speak Spanish. Teachers must help the student to construct this other language without pressure so they feel relaxed. So in this quote, we observe the teacher's sensitivity to the emotions of her students in her concern that they feel relaxed, which she believed would support the difficult cognitive um, process of learning a second language. Her concern is consistent with Vygotsky's understanding that learning involves, and this is a quote from um, Vygotsky, that learning involves a unity of affective and intellectual processes. So Ms. Ramirez had it right. Now, it doesn't have to be positive, by the way, but it was in her case. I mean, positive affect. Um, so a major finding of the Ballinger and Lister study was that the teacher's expectations played a pivotal role in determining their students' uh, choices. That is, the teacher's use of Spanish and their expectations of students' Spanish use were highly related to the use of Spanish by their students. Making one's expectations clear to learners is as much affective as it is cognitive, as its success is dependent on the nature of the student-teacher relationship. Furthermore, providing an environment in which language use expectations are clear and established creates a level of comfort and security. Students can participate with confidence then about their language choice. Now, I'm gonna skip a couple of um, slides here but, and take you right to the second guiding principle. Um, the first half of which comes from what I just said the second half, in fact, comes from uh, some other work, which I'll explain. So the teacher, here's the second guiding principle. Teachers need to set clear expectations about L1, L2 use in order to create a secure classroom environment in which students are able to engage in interaction with confidence. For younger children, this goal can be accomplished through a teacher's consistent use of the L1 and target language. Now, let me read the second part, and then I'll just explain it to you. For older children, so here we're talking about children who are um, 9, 10, 11, and on up. Uh, so for older children, this goal, um, the, the goal of, of establishing um, clear expectations, can further be accomplished through teacher-student negotiation of a set of classroom practices relating to the use of the L1 and the target language. Successful realization of this goal with older students will involve making beliefs explicit about the cognitive emotive interface in language use and language learning, leading to a constructive climate of cooperation in the classroom. Now, this bit about older children is not, I, I, don't, I can't find that in the immersion literature, this attempt to negotiate um, uh, the language use practices. 
But there's um, an, a book that's been written by Glenn Levine, um, and the reference is in your handout, um, that talks about um, code switching in classrooms. And it, it, um, it's all, all the research is done in foreign language context. It's not done in, in immersion context. But I think uh, it really makes a lot of sense. And what he, he gives all kinds of ideas about how it is that one um, can, that teachers and students can, together can make their own belief systems explicit um, and make it explicit. And then you can start to negotiate when and how and what language you use at what time. And I think um, it really is another aspect, it's another whole aspect of, of, of Vygotsky's um, theory is how it is that our own practices, what it is that we do in today, this very day, what it is that we believe, what our beliefs are, that that, that is so dependent on what our own personal experiences and our own personal history has been. So that, um, Everybody has had different experiences. So everybody comes to a classroom. Teachers, immersion teachers, and students all come to a classroom with different ideas um, and, and different meanings for language. So for some people, there's no question that language is, um, uh, is very highly related to identity. And so um, if that's the case, then there may be good reasons why learners aren't using a particular language because it somehow or other negates their identity. And that sort of thing needs to be brought out and talked about explicitly in, in um, immersion programs, but certainly can't be done um, until st students are old enough to be able to carry on that kind of discussion. OK, um, I'm very short on time. So what I'm going to do is take you directly to the third guiding principle, which relates to the zone of proximal development. And well, I'm not going to take you quite immediately there, because I want to give you the definition, at least, of the ZPD for those who don't know what it is. It's an interaction during which, through mediation, and there's mediation again, through mediation, an individual achieves more than she could have achieved if she'd been working alone, just like we saw with J and um, Z. Um, and Wells, uh, Gordon Wells, said that learning in the ZPD involves all aspects of the learner, acting, feeling, and thinking. So again, in, in neo Vygotskyan theory, you need to think of the ZPD not as um, a space, but rather as an activity, and as an activity in which um, all aspects of, of one's life is, is brought together. And also one in which one is always building from the known um, to the unknown. So I was going to give you an example, which is on your handout. But um, the reason I was going to give you that example was because the teacher is, um, succeeds in, in he's teaching a lesson on the greenhouse effect. And he has planned a whole, he knows what kinds of complex structures he wants to introduce. And so he introduces those structures, um, and he does it with almost no use of English. In fact, the only reason he uses English is to contrast it against a particular structure that he is trying to teach. And when you see the lesson as a whole, which of course I wouldn't be able to show you, but the whole lesson is just like one huge, great big ZPD, ZPD um, in that he is always constantly building and constantly planning his use of, of, uh, um, of English. Um, and all the rest of the time, he continues to, um, to stay in the target language. So the third guiding principle, and note that this, OK, so this is for teachers. And this is much less so from Vygotsky, but rather is a policy statement. For teachers, the target language always has priority because a policy goal of immersion education is to achieve a high level of proficiency in the target language. Use of the L1 should be purposeful, not random. Use of the L1 to illustrate cross-linguistic comparisons or to provide the meaning of abstract vocabulary items can help to mediate L2 development during ZPD activity in the target language. 
Now, that last part is particularly important. It's during ZPD. There's a lot of teaching that goes on that isn't ZPD-ish. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, yes. I'll just leave it at that. There's a lot of teaching that goes on that isn't ZBT. Part of this is assuming that much of what teaching is is a form of, of, of a ZPD activity and that um, that occurs in the target language. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize. Um, so Vygotsky's... Um, Um, concepts, uh, which I've gone very, uh, taken a lot of time to get through. Um, the first one about mediation and the related concept of languaging, um, but I think it's so important. Um, and um, the intertwining of cognition and emotion and the ZPD. These concepts yielded three theory-based guiding principles related to the use of the L1 and target language in one-way and two-way immersion programs. The first guiding principle focuses on students' use, not teachers' use, students' use of the L1 and target language. The second focused on the relationships between teachers and students and how these relationships link to language use patterns. And the third focused on the teacher's use of the L1 and target language. So I hope these guiding principles serve to reassure teachers and teacher educators that students' L1 languaging may be essential and beneficial to L2 development, as well as potentially an efficient route to L2 development, and that the ways in which teachers use language to mediate classroom interaction truly matters. And finally, I hope this talk makes clear how much we, how much we need more research in the immersion classroom. And we particularly, at least from the point of view of this talk, we particularly need research that traces student and teacher languaging to student language learning outcomes. And I think this is an absolutely wonderful opportunity for action research by teachers. Thank you. Meryl, thank you so much for that very thought-provoking and, and wonderful talk. We have some time for some comments and questions from the audience, and I'll be running around to provide you with the microphone. Uh, so are there some people that might want to ask something, say something? Thank you. What is your advice for students who have not a strong foundation in L1 and are learning a second language and are struggling with the learning of that second language because of a lack of a strong foundation in L1? You know, if I could have guessed what the first question would be, it would be that one. <laughs> um, do you want to explain a wee bit? Dee, just a minute. Don't take the microphone away. Okay. <laughs> Um, do you want to explain what you mean by not having a strong L1 foundation? Well, the case I'm particularly thinking of, he, ha he's, he has two languages at home, mm -hmm. French and English, and he's been exposed to a third language, Spanish, in our program. And he was uh, tested, and he has all his verbal area scores very low. So he has actual difficulties in learning through his verbal input and output of information. And he's been exposed to three languages, basically. Right. Okay, well, we really need uh, Fred Genesee to answer this question, because he's the one that's been doing all the studies in that area, um, and, the, and the work in that area. But Fred, tell me if I'm wrong. My, my response to that is that, um, that probably that's an issue that would cross whatever language he's, it's not because he has three languages that he has this problem. That it's probably 
something that crosses all languages. It's an issue that, that would happen in, no matter what the language is. So from the perspective of, of um, immersion education, immersion should be providing the same kind of support that a child would if they were in French or in English, um, the, the child's first languages. There's, there's, it, um, Fred, is that okay? He liked that. Um, and, and of course also, um, in, in an immersion program, the student does have so, some time in, a, in, in their mother tongue, in the first language, um, although not if it's not English, <laughs> which, which can be an issue. But yeah, I think, I mean, you, I think you have to look at, the, at, the, at the, um, the problem as being something that is a problem, not, and certainly not related to the, are uh, highly unlikely to be related to the fact that they're learning three languages. Yeah, Roy, Roy can yell. Uh, Meryl, you, <coughs> sorry, you mentioned L1 languaging and L2 languaging, and I'm wondering if languaging can take place in, in a way that's not language specific. My understanding of, of languaging is that it doesn't have to be encoded through one specific language, but that so I wouldn't talk, I'm, I'm just, well, sorry, I'm just asking you this question. If you see languaging as being always language specific, you're doing it either in L1 or you're doing it in L2, and there's nothing kind of in between, or there's no mental ease that is helping a learner to sort of conceptually understand something through languaging that isn't just in one language or the other. Do you understand, is that a uh, fair yeah, question? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, the point about languaging is that it is, it is um, I don't know if I would, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think, you're, I think you're, t you're talking about something that isn't language-based. And I mean, the whole point of languaging is to get something that isn't language-based into language. It's, it's, it's mediating the, the, that, that, that idea that you have. You know, you know you have something to say, but you're not quite sure like just like you started that question, perhaps, <laughs> um, and and you know, like if we talk about this for the next half hour, by the end of it, you'll have your question well formulated, and I'll probably have an answer better formulated too. But but it's so so languaging is getting that idea into a form where you can actually then work with it and think more about it. So. That it's um, in a language, yes. Does it have to be pure L1 or pure L2? I, I, I don't know. I've never thought about that. I mean, that's, I, I don't, um, I mean, the studies that we've done with languaging, um, it was certainly the stuff with, with, in, with collaborative dialogue, I mean, the students are using both English and French, but they're not like code switching and code mixing in, in the, in the sense that it's sort of like a mix of languages. They're using English for very specific purposes, which frames their use of French or vice versa. Um, so I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Uh, perhaps I'll jump in here. I, I think Roy's question might relate to the earlier one, especially when you, especially if you've got children who are learning two or three languages simultaneously. And the, the um, you know, from a neurocognitive point of view, the, the uh, picture that's emerging is that these children's language competencies are really distributed across the languages that they're co-learning. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, expre the, their, the expression of their competence probably has to be assessed or allowed to be expressed in, 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 in a bilingual kind of fashion. Yeah. And you know, there's compelling evidence to show that uh, children's uh, bilingual children. Now, we don't know the extent to which this is true for second language learners as opposed to bilingual learners, yeah. kids who learn two languages simultaneously, yeah. but that both languages are active at all times. And that uh, when children are even, ex even so much so that when children are exposed to a single language, say a word, 
that the, uh, an equivalent or the cognate word or related words in the other language is actually partially activated. activated sure. So there's not a selective activation of language, even when children are in a, in a monolingual mode. And I think it goes back to the early comment, and, and I agree with your response in that, um, especially actually in children like this who might have a language impairment and are bilingual, that the best way for them to language is bilingually. Yeah. And the best way for them to access and to articulate their thoughts would be to use their combined linguistic resources. And this is why these children often look like they're um, performing below par if they're tested or examined monolingually because in That's fact right. they have a bilingual representation yeah. of knowledge and they have a bilingual form of expression of that knowledge. So well, I think it links to Roy's question in that there's no reason why you wouldn't let the children language bilingually. Yeah, it was, yeah it's language, it's not, it's, it, I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to see what that test is, but I mean, Fred, as you should, <laughs> that's Fred Genesee, by, by the way. As Fred should, as Fred knows well, my PhD thesis was on children learning languages bilingually, and one of the things that I said was, it's incredible, I mean, everybody seems to, at that time, and this is, you know, like 40 plus years ago, I mean, it seemed that if you, I mean, if you look at what the, the, kid, uh, the kids that I, were, I was studying, if you looked at just what they could do in French and just what they could do in English, they looked like they were behind. But if you looked at both of them combined, which is what I argued from my thesis, then they have a much bigger repertoire, in fact, than do unilingual children of the same age level, same developmental level. So it's, um, I, yeah. Um, how I think I think um, I suppose my reaction to the testing or having them do the, a test bilingually is in effect letting them choose what they want to do and how they want to do it in which language, and that's that that would be to me the way to get at what you're talking about, rather than us trying to develop a bilingual test that we then impose on the child. So you could do some, some kind of dynamic assessment, for example, where you're always building from where the child is at in whichever language they wish to do it in. Okay, there was another question back here, yeah. D at the back. Oh, I'll just okay. <laughs> Yeah, I see what you're saying. operates in that case, I think, can be, can be a very different process. Yeah. Can I, 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 I mean, I, I, didn't, I don't feel at all confident to speak about Asperger's and autism and so on, but I shouldn't leave you with the idea that Vygotsky said that the only mediating tool is language. It's one, and it's the one that he thought was the most important, that it's, it's the most effective in its it has various forms, both oral and written, right? Um, but, you know, music is also a mediating tool. Art is also mediating. So, so um, 
And Vygotsky did work with um, young children who had problems. Um, and he, I, I think the best way to summarize what he said or what he, what he did was to show that if a different mediating tool was used, the child could get much further than what they were, how far they were getting with the mediating tool that was being used. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So, so Vygotsky's, Vygotsky's way of going about this is the problem is, is um, not in the child, the problem is in us in that we haven't been creative enough in finding the appropriate mediating tool. Okay? So that, that's my response to that question. And, and, and to your first question, I mean, it is interesting um, what you say, that, that the L1 for math, if they've been taking all their math, say, in Spanish, is Spanish, even though their home language is English. But I'm willing to bet that if you, if you and I study some of those people that you're talking about, we would find that they have done a lot of their thinking about math in English. That they have worked it through cognitively, these difficult math concepts in their, L, in their home language, and eventually have gotten to the point where they can express it in their L2. And now, I don't, I mean, I, I don't have any evidence for that, but, but I think that um, when you talk to children, and I, I mean, I, I know of a particular case of a child who actually um, switched in high school into learning math and English, and her response was, it was a snap. It was a snap. So I don't know if that's true or not. He said, it's just a matter of learning vocabulary words. The thinking processes were similar. So that, that's a case of one. We have another question back here. Um, I used to call it processing out loud whenever I would walk with my husband. I'd say, I don't know what I'm thinking. I'm processing out loud. Now I'm going to tell him I'm languaging. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> I, I like that. It's, it's, it's more succinct. So anyway, um, I'm thinking about the Nina and Dara example and how they, they, they used or, or the, the idea of the teacher giving them a new you know, kind of a new meaning for the, the word that they were looking for and they didn't like that and the processing they, they then did in their L1. And I have found just working in an early total one-way program and allowing students kind of to process those vague concepts. I'm thinking of a seventh grader, for example. And the minute the expectation is you can do that in L1, it seems to me that the, the, the room to grow linguistically then has been taken away in the L2 because to explain something in the L2 pushes you cognitively, you, you, it pushes you both cognitively and linguistically. And I, I keep thinking too of the common core and how it's seeming in, in a strange way now the national common core looking at like the six through 12 standards and seeing what students, the tasks they're required to do cognitively, and I keep seeing the proficiency levels. And I keep thinking, if, if, if academically we want these students to be able to, in their second language, do grade level appropriate work, why aren't they then able to handle that in their second language. Because if all of the groundwork was laid in an early total start program, then cognitively and linguistically, they should be prepared to handle those tasks. So I guess I just, I still don't quite, I don't know. I okay. can't believe I'm like saying this to Meryl Swain, but I'm sorry, <laughs> I just, I, I really want to understand, no, so. It's good, it's great. Can I, can I just, um, okay, I, I have a couple of reactions. <laughs> um, First of all, remember that some of the teachers that are teaching in immersion are not like you. So, for example, the very first person that I cited, Mary, um, was using a lot of English. So that's part of your answer, is that because they're not getting this rich, I mean, um, I don't want to use the word input, but that because <laughs> it's almost embarrassing. Uh, 
um, that because they're because they're not getting um, a huge amount of, of 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 the teacher talk, they're not developing those skills that they need to. So that's another reason for the the guiding principle number three is that the teachers need to stay in the the target language as much as possible, and and only when it's it's something that could give could help them scaffold language wise or cognitive wise, um, is there any reason at all to to move into the target language? But as Becky said, she's never had to, um, and she and certainly at the early grade levels. I mean, late immersion, you know, that's another. It's a, but but I've got the same kind of quotes from late immersion student teachers in terms of their willingness to do French only versus um, starting off with a lot of English and moving into French. So, um, so that's, I think, part of the answer. Um, the, the other thing, so I haven't answered all of it though. Um, why, why can't they language, why aren't they, Okay, that, that if, we for, if we force them to do it in the L2, that that would push them cognitively and linguistically, I think is your point. Okay, here's my response to that. We can't force them because people will do covertly if you don't do it, if you don't let them do it overtly. And um, covertly actually wouldn't be as, as successful but I know of no circumstance, any circumstance at all, where the going gets really tough in a second language, that people don't turn back, if they have a strong first language, that they don't turn back to that first language. And um, I, 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 was, I spent um, a couple of weeks in China, and I was absolutely astonished at the level of English in this particular English department that I went to, where people, um, had never lived outside of Beijing, and their English was astonishingly good. And um, they, they really didn't like this idea of languaging in the L1 at all. Um, and they certainly weren't going to let their students do it, and that was that. So then I started, I said to the, okay, so I know each and every one of you here have written an article you have written and published in English. How did you get there? Did you use any Mandarin to do that? Ah, uh, well, or, um, yes. I mean, it's almost inevitable. Why don't you let your students do it? Well, our students would never become as good as us if we didn't force them to use English. But if you talk to those students, every one of those students will tell you that at some point in every class that they are, in fact, processing, to use your word, languaging, to use mine, um, in, in, in their native language, in their first language. So you can't force. It's not something that we can stop. We can do a lot to encourage maximal use of the L2. We can structure activities in ways that include it, and that's what I was trying to say. One of the ways of structuring it is making sure nothing is ever done in class where the students don't have to do, have an output, and a product in the L2. They're for, then that's forcing them, but it's forcing them in a way that they, they, they are making comparisons and contrasts and dealing with both languages. Yeah. Can she? I, I, I yeah, <laughs> they're videotaping. You need to be on the mic. Oh dear. <laughs> um, and there were points in my relationship with the people from whom I was learning, just being in Spain, and I so desperately wanted to express myself that I just struggled and struggled and struggled because I couldn't resort to my L1. I d they wouldn't have understood me. Uh -huh. And so I guess that's more what I was referring to, that it seems that I know that when given the choice, I take the easy road often. Um, 
And it's, it's, I don't mean force, I guess it's preparing them, like you said, well enough yeah. so that they can negotiate and push themselves linguist, yeah. push themselves internally because right. they're trying to convey something yeah. and they might not have it all, yeah. but they're gonna language and language too until they get there. I don't know, I just, but, that's but, all I was. But the very fact that you said that you struggled and struggled and struggled. Right. I'm sure that part of that struggle included some help from English. In my head, absolutely. Yep. Yep. But I saying. still had a four. Yes, I agree completely. Okay. Hey. Meryl Swain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, we're out of time. These are wonderful questions. Before we give Meryl a final applause, I have two quick announcements. The planning committee is asked to come up here for a photo, and there is a wonderful reception awaiting the group uh, outside the doors here. But thank you very much, Meryl. This was fantastic. Way to start. <laughs>